Hey Moneymakers, I'm Kalila Reynolds and welcome to Taking Stock. We're bringing you all the latest business news and telling you how it will affect you and your money. But before we get started, head over to my website as usual, kalilareynolds.com to subscribe to my newsletter. I'm going to be sharing my personal budgeting and investing templates next week but only to those on my email list. So make sure that you're subscribed. You can click the link up here or in the description box below. Also, we're now on TuneIn Radio Podcast, so you can listen in your car. And thanks for making us the number one business podcast in Jamaica. Now, come on, let's get this money. First up, we're continuing our look at the crypto market this week by looking at non-fungible tokens, NFTs. People in the art and music world are flocking to them, with rapper Eminem selling his first NFT collection for nearly 2 million US dollars, while in Jamaica singer Basie from TOK has launched his own reggae NFT. Okay, but what exactly is it? And can I do it for myself? We'll find out. And later, the analysts swing on the latest market developments. Guardian Holdings is now listed on the main market of the Jamaica Stock Exchange. How has the stock performed so far? I am surprised by the, by the, the uptick in the queue. Separate and Wisinka's results are out. How did they do? And SVL has bought up a 10% stake in main event. But is it a conflict of interest? Um, so how it is on the appearance, you know, it factors into you know how you think about ethics we'll discuss but first here's what's hot brought to you by jamaica money market brokers your best interest at heart supreme ventures and main event entertainment group are partnering to create a production company the news follows svl's recent purchase of a 10 percent stake in the production and entertainment company SVL says it will be leveraging growth from that transaction to gain a foothold in the entertainment space. Both companies will own 50% of the new production company. Executive Chairman of SVL Group Gary Peart says the new company will take advantage of the huge potential in the market. Pulse Investments will be seeking fresh capital on the bond market to finance construction of Phase 1 of Pulse Homes at Bileronai. Executive Chairman Kingsley Cooper says the transaction should be finalized around mid-June. The size of the new bond has not yet been disclosed. The proceeds will be used to build the first 15 residences of the 30-unit Pulse Homes development. Pulse is paying its executive chairman some $600 million for the Villaronai property that he owns. Pulse also said it was in the process of acquiring property adjoining Villaronai. In the meantime, the company is planning to pursue its additional public offering sometime later. Colossal Holdings IC has listed $2 billion worth of securities on the Jamaica Stock Exchange's private market. It listed cumulative redeemable preference shares due 2022 valued at just over $705 million and a senior secured 4.25% fixed rate bond valued at $1.3 billion. With the two listings, the value of securities on the private market increased to $9 billion. That's about 6% of the junior market's capitalization. The first two securities which were taken to the market by Guardian Holdings Limited were listed in February. 13 trades were recorded on the private market in April, valued at $8.67 billion. Epli Caribbean Property Fund has acquired two office buildings in Trinidad and Tobago. General Manager of Epley Justin Nam says the acquisitions are directly in line with the company's strategy to scale and diversify by geography and asset type. The real estate mutual fund now owns 16 buildings in Jamaica, Barbados and Trinidad and Tobago, comprising over 775,000 square feet. Jamaicans abroad sent home 30% more money in February than they did a year earlier in 2020. According to data from the Bank of Jamaica, net remittance inflows increased by nearly 50 million US dollars in February. This means family and friends in the diaspora sent back roughly 212 million US. That's a little less than the 224 million US dollars sent in January. Between April 2020 and February 2021, Jamaicans abroad sent home 2.6 billion US dollars in total. 68% of the remittances in February came from the United States. 13% came from the UK, Canada contributed 9%, and the Cayman Islands about 
The e-commerce national delivery system ENDS was rolled out to the entire island last week after a successful pilot. Prime Minister Andrew Holness told Parliament that the demand has been overwhelming. He says work is also underway to launch ENDS 2.0, which will include a redesigned website and mobile apps. The upgrade will also feature interconnection with other government systems to facilitate proper monitoring and enforcement. ENDS allows the quick service industry and delivery operators registered on the platform to operate during the hours of the curfew until midnight. What's Hot was brought to you by Jamaica Money Market Brokers, your best interest at heart. And when we come back, light Bitcoin NFTs have been gaining public interest among investors and especially those in arts and entertainment in the past year. But why? And how do we get a piece of the pie? Hey, moneymakers, you're not an official part of the family until you have your merch. Visit kalilorenolds.com slash store to order your t-shirt and your mask today. Let's get this money. This segment of Taking Stock is brought to you by Bulwark Insurance Agency. Insurance made easy. And Massey United Insurance. How good is your insurance? Welcome back to Taking Stock. If you've heard about Bitcoin, Ethereum, or Dogecoin, then chances are you've also heard about non-fungible tokens, NFTs. Last week, CEO of Caracoin, Karsten Becker, told us that they've launched a reggae NFT in partnership with reggae dancehall recording artist Basie from TOK. Well, Karsten is back, and we're also scheduled to be joined by Basie to tell us all about it. Welcome back, Karsten. Thank you. Uh, we're supposed to be joined by Basie, but we're having some trouble connecting with him. Uh, he's in Germany? Yes, he's in Germany right now. So. And you're in Spain? Yes, I'm in Spain. So we're doing a real multinational thing here. I love what the technology allows. Yes, it does. COVID has reconnected the world in a big way. So today we're talking about NFTs, another hot topic in this uh, this whole crypto world, this whole world of digital assets, digital currencies, and I first started hearing about crypto, uh, sorry, about uh, NFTs just a few months ago. So, is this a new thing, Karsten? You know, the the NFTs have actually been around for about two years plus, maybe three years. Um, they started with a project really called Crypto Kitties which al allowed people to collect little playing cards based on cats. And it was kind of very interesting because if you bought a male cat and a female cat, you could actually breed them and have child cats and sell the children, so to speak, like we, we normally do pets. And um, CryptoKitties really exploded and it is now a multi-million dollar business. The, the cats go from anywhere from you know, 0.1 Ethereum up to 10 Ethereum, which means anywhere from $100 up to $10,000, $20,000. I saw a Spock cat selling for like 30 grand. So CryptoKitties started the whole NFT revolution, but they didn't really go mainstream until around December, January during the COVID when um, it, it kind of moved from collectibles into the art world. And a lot of artists realized that uh, instead of paying a 30% commission to a gallery, they could sell their art digitally using NFTs as the underlying manner of doing it. So with that, we saw the NFT market go from a million dollar market to a billion dollar market. Okay, so I think we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves. Just tell me, what exactly is NFT? So NFT is what we call a non-fungible token, right? You have different types of, of tokens in the crypto world. Um, fungible tokens basically are cryptocurrencies, which means that you can split them. So I can take one Bitcoin, I can break it into two. You don't have to buy one Bitcoin, you can buy 0 0.01 of a Bitcoin, right? So fungible tokens are meant to be spent, right? If you have a dollar bill, what, what makes it really useful is if I can pay you and you can give me back change. Now, when it comes to the world of art or music, you can't really break an, a, a, a painting in two. You can't be, pay, break um, a song in two. So they create, came up with another standard which allowed us to digitize um, assets uh, in an unbreakable manner. So non-fungible tokens or NFTs, or they call them NFTs, um, it is basically the ability to take any asset, digitize it in a manner where it can't be broken, 
but it can be transferred. So I can transfer a song from me to you. I can transfer a piece of art. Um, you could even, if you made a, took your, the title for your house and created an NFT out of it, I could transfer the title to you um, and basically give you the right of digital ownership. And what does that mean, digital ownership, as opposed to ownership in the real world? So I guess what is ownership in the real world, right? Um, in, in the world of cryptocurrencies, ownership is really your, your, you have a wallet and that wallet belongs to you. It's verified on the blockchain as yours and you can receive cryptocurrencies into that wallet or send them out of that wallet to other people. So that's really, you know, the concept of ownership. Now, NFTs allowed us to extend wallets to also um, basically to, to host a, a digital title. So a digital title to a piece of art. Um, but then when they took it even further recently this year by actually marketplaces popped up selling digital art, collectibles being, of course, a great place. So a, a lot of the playing cards in America, baseball playing cards, football playing cards, these all moved immediately into the NFT space. I think the NFL or the NBA has a huge program where you can buy playing cards of athletes um, digitally as NFTs. And you know, if I buy a card, it, it's it's guaranteed that it's unique and that it will belong to me. There's no middleman. And if I wanted to sell it, I can transfer it from me directly to you or whoever is looking to buy it. What is the value of holding a piece of digital art? So can I? Well, you said you can sell it, so you can you can monetize it. But can I? I can't hang it on my wall because it's a piece of digital art. What do I do with it? So really, you know, starting out in the world of collectibles, but right, the, the, the world moves quickly, I think, especially during COVID. So you can't hang it on your wall, but they already have digital picture frames, which will probably get more and more popular. So if I own digital art, I will be able to hang it on my wall at some point in time. Um, playing cards are probably a, a much better um solution in this market at the moment because i don't really need to have five playing cards right of different athletes i can host them in an app on my phone but rest assured i know that these ones are mine they can't be copied they can't be um taken from me so i i can i'm the only one who can sell them or transfer them mm -hmm. but you could print them because i know I, I recently bought a piece of digital art from an artist and it was a print of right. the, the artwork mm -hmm. So you could print them, but um, you still would then have the title on your phone, right? So, I mean, what makes any art special? Um, it can all be copied these days, right? So the, the, the title of ownership is more about um, knowing that you have the original, right? I'm a, As an artist, I create a song. Uh, I create an NFT out of that song. I destroy any other copies of it. Um, and then that song moves with the NFT from from owner to owner to owner. Now, can you copy it? Yes, but you know, if I copy it, I really just have a copy. What's the value of a copy? Copies in the original. Right. So, how does this work in music? Because I can understand in in the art world, you want to have something unique that nobody else has. Hang it on your wall. Do whatever you're gonna do with it in, in your digital picture frame. But in music, millions of people listen to the same song. So. Is it that artists are creating a unique song for just one person? How does this work? Not really. So when you create an NFT, you can create one, but you can also create a collection. So I can say I'm going to create um, 10,000 copies of this song in the collection. There will only ever be 10,000, right? Now, of course, with art, usually you'll just do one. With songs, right? I mean, if you go back to how music started, an artist would create you know, um, 10,000 records and then sell his records. Uh, the, the value of these records would go up um, if the artist didn't create more records, right? Uh, music changed to whereby we move from records to songs. Um, then it changed again to streaming, which took all the value out of music for artists because then it's about how many millions of people can listen to my song for me to make, you know, $20. Uh, streaming killed, killed the music industry in a big way. Um, it forced artists to tour. And I think COVID kind of brought up the realization that, you know, if you remove touring, artists aren't making any money anymore. The streaming companies are, the record labels are splitting money with the streaming companies and nothing comes back to the artists. NFTs allow me as a musician to create, um, take one of my songs, create a, limit, create a limited edition release of say a thousand copies and start selling those directly to my fans.
my fans like me and my music, they'll support me. They'll buy them because they know that they will own this song. It will be like back in the day when I bought a CD or I bought a record. I own that record, I own that CD. People had huge CD collections and huge record collections, right? Because you know they know they were supporting the artist, supporting the music, but they also had an asset that they could sell later on. Um, I read recently some guy sold his um, record collection for like thirty, forty thousand dollars of antique records, right? So there, there's a lot to be said for ownership and a lot to be said for empowering artists with the ability to start, you know, taking the music they create and sell it directly again. So does that mean that these songs can't be played on the radio, can't be used on streaming sites? You know, it's a good question. I guess it comes down to the, the nature of it. So um, if I sell an NFT of a song directly from me to you, you can listen to it, you can use it. Um, can you play it on the radio? Maybe not, unless the radio station um, has a pre-release. So I can still use traditional means of getting my music out there, right? That's not going to stop me as the artist from, say, transferring one copy of the song to um, the disc jockey. He then owns it. He can play it on the radio if I, if he has the, the permission, right, of the, the original copyright owner. NFTs don't get rid of copyright. So I can't take your song and create an NFT out of it and start selling it, right? It's still, you know, right of ownership and copyright combines with NFTs. So in the future, um, you know, if say the, the 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 title office says we respect NFTs, we want to put um, titles of houses on NFTs, right? Then all of a sudden it means that I can sell my house directly by transferring the NFT which has my title encoded in it from me to you. We don't need a middleman. We don't need a bunch of lawyers. Um, we save a ton of costs. Uh, and this is a big part of NFTs as well. Very interesting. So I know you've been working a lot in the Jamaican space. You're very familiar with the culture here. What type of progress has been made in, in establishing this here? Is there, for example, any communication with Jam Copy or Jaipo or those types of organizations? No, I mean, we're working mainly on the technology side. We're working directly with artists and, um, you know, I individuals looking to enter the space, right? So, of course, we worked with Basie. We actually took a song, um, put a song out there as an NFT. I think it was the first reggae song to be released as an NFT. So exploring new ground. He's doing a couple of albums. Um, but I think there's a lot of other interest in this space, especially with COVID, right? So you got a lot of artists now who need ways to make money, right? So if you can't tour, if you can't leave your house, um, you know, how do you make money, right? So Eminem released a whole bunch of NFTs of collectible playing cards. Playing cards seem to be popular with large artists, right? Because they're tradable, they're cute, they're interesting. Um, but a lot of large artists in Europe are doing NFTs that combine music and art. Um, Calvin Harris, who's a huge DJ, did it. Um, in Jamaica, I think Morgan Heritage also released a bunch of playing card NFTs. They, they sold out in actually record time. So people are making money. Um, any artist who's stuck at home, you know, I would encourage them to kind of look at this technology and see if they can use it to start also earning money directly. And they may realize over time, maybe they don't really need the record labels as much as they thought they did. Hmm. Well, well, you still need promotion because people still need to know who you are and still need to hear the music in order to promote it. Because now, how do I know that I want to buy this reg this uh, musical mm. NFT if I've never even heard it? Like, you need, you need unless they're a big artist and I say, okay, Rihanna's putting out an NFT, I'm going to buy anything Rihanna puts out. Right. I don't want to buy it unless I've actually heard it before and like it. True, but there's the flip side. When you're a small artist and you have little to no coverage anyway, Normally you go there and you work, right? You, you work, you shop your music, you sell it directly, you build your fans, right? With streaming, you, you got nothing to sell to your fans, right? I mean, unless you, you, you push them uh, to buy your CDs. But, you know, it's probably better off to sell 10 NFTs than it is to, to stream your song a million times. So if you, if you look at streaming and radio as promotion and NFTs as a way to make money, it's probably a better model. Um, it, it brings the, 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 the nature of selling products to fans back into play um, and makes it important again. But if I can stream the song, then why buy it? As Support the artist. If you stream the song, he makes no money, right? I think on a, on a million streams, an artist may make 100 bucks. I mean, how many upcoming artists have a million streams, right, a month? So 
um, if you don't support the artist, the artist can't make music. It's a catch-22, right? But if I'm an upcoming artist and I'm cool and my fans would like me, I'll buy an NFT of this artist. I'll buy a song here. I'll buy a song there. You know, it's, it's about, you know, mu the corporations have turned music into um, – into something that's mechanical. We tend to forget that the artist needs to eat as well. He needs to make money. He needs a way to, to generate an income. Um, how, how do I become a famous artist if I can't, um, if I can't, you know, buy food? So what are the costs? What are our music NFTs, for example, selling for? NFTs are selling anywhere from, 10, 20, 30 dollars up to thousands of dollars. I mean, the NFT market's kind of crazy. Um, it has a huge fluctuating price range. Um, you have artists selling NFTs for $50 million right now. The market's kind of exploded, but um, there's a lot of fees when using NFTs because of the, the underlying technology. And a lot of companies are working on solving these problems to remove the fees. So it can cost you $10 to buy a $10 NFT right now. But we believe um, newer technologies coming out will remove those costs because those fees don't go to anyone. They go to the network that supports the cryptocurrencies. So as those, as those fees go away, um, but the other cool thing is a lot of NFTs are being bought by people with cryptocurrencies, right? So you got people who had, you know, $100 worth of Bitcoin. Now it's worth um, $100,000 worth of Bitcoin or whatever. Um, what do I do with it? If I cash it out, I'm going to pay tax. So... Let me reinvest it in, in other digital technology, right? So I'm going to use it and buy a bunch of NFTs myself. And this is one of the other things fueling the market, right? It's really the, the crypto boom. The people with cryptocurrencies are out there um, spending crypto on crypto. You know, I'm here thinking, okay, wow, I have some pieces of art that I could convert to NFT, like some original artwork. You guys didn't know I'm an artist, right? I mean, a exactly. visual, artist. visual artist. And I also have some some recordings that I could use, as, I could convert to NFTs. Right. But how do I do that if I wanted to? You need to engage someone. Um, you can go to some of the sites that uh, empower you to do this if you know what you're doing. So Rarible, OpenSea, they have very easy tools if you're familiar with the process that will allow you to quite quickly. Um, what's, what's so those websites again? Rarible, R-A-R-I-B-L-E is one. OpenSea, Open, open S-E-A. Um, they allow you to create an account quickly. Um, you need a, a DeFi wallet. MetaMask is the wallet of choice these days. So MetaMask is probably the starting point. You create an, a wallet. You go to these sites and they walk you through the process of of stamping and creating nfts i mean there's there's ways to do it on a larger scale if you're a larger artist where you kind of create your own coins your own tokens they're reusable there's no commissions to the platform so that we're kind of doing it this way helping independence but anyone can go to OpenSea and immediately create um nfts and put them up for sale and you know if you have a big following behind you if you let your your following know, like if you you, I'm sure you have a big Instagram following. If you took a couple of pieces of arts and put them up as NFTs, you'd be surprised to see how quickly they would sell. So I can, if it's artwork, I can sell more than one copy. Yes, you can either release um, a single original, which will sell for more money, or you right. could do um, a, a series of ten of the same. So, but what you're really saying is, I'm not going to do more. If I do one, it's only going to be one right or if i'm going to do 10 it's only going to be 10. so people will buy up the 10 and then they will start trading them another real cool part of nfts is they have a royalty model built in so if i create a painting for a thousand dollars create an nft as part of creating it i can input um, a royalty um destination anytime the nft changes hands the difference in price between um, the last sale and the new sale, 10% or 20% of that is automatically paid out as a commission. So this means if I say create a thousand NFTs, I can give them all away for free. Um, and, and if people start trading them, then I start to make money um, on the commissions and the royalties. So there's a lot of really cool stuff going on in the NFT space. Very interesting, Karsten. I wish we had Basie on so he could tell us about the experience so far. How much does his sell for? His, his one song for, that he's done? One song for about $200 um, a pop. The price of Ethereum, I think, almost doubled. So the value of his NFTs uh, went from $200 to $350, $400 for one. 
Oh, because it's priced in Ethereum. It's not priced yeah. in dollars. These are priced in crypto, so they move also with the market, right? So, which is also pretty cool. Can you price it in dollars? You can price them um, in equivalent, so equivalent of dollars, right? Mm. And how many copies did he do of this song? Um, he did just seven. So he did a test of seven limited edition NFTs. Um, and we're following up with the album and the collecting cards. So those will be coming out shortly. Um, I think the collectible cards will probably be um, a thousand in total, um, four cards of 250 each. And um, they'll be probably priced at a couple of dollars and we'll see how the trading goes. The album is much more interesting because you know we have to actually connect don't connect downloadable content, right? So you actually buy the NFT and it includes links to download the album, um, special things that you want to give away along with the NFT, for instance, such as um, um, special memorabilia, um, a sign, sign digital um, art if an artist. So you can bulk things up along with an NFT when you give it away, right? You, you don't. It doesn't just have to be. The digital item right so for instance uh kings of leon they did um a, a series of nfts and the first hundred copies included a a physical um record that was stamped with the uh the the id number of the nft and shipped to the buyer so um this is really about re-engaging fans you know giving them more than they got before which is great because i believe fans do deserve to get more so are the seven copies all sold Yep, his are all sold. That's awesome. And what kind of interest are you seeing from other artists? We're seeing a ton of interest, um, actually. So we'll hopefully see a lot more um, coming to market over time. I think we're focused right now on trying to finish his um, albums. And I know that he's also talking to a bunch of other artists that he works with, um, including TOK, who's going to be doing their own stuff as well. But I can't really speak on their behalf. We look forward to hearing that. I'm sure some big names are going to be jumping on this very soon, too. Yes. I mean, Eminem just jumped on it, right? Yeah. So the big names are, are here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I need to get cracking on my own NFTs, don't I? Yes, you do. You do. I have some ideas already just speaking to you. Yes. So we can help you. Awesome. Thanks, Karsten. Okay, great. Um, I'll try and get, hopefully we can get hold of Basie and get him to transfer one of his to you, right? All right, cool. Up next, we've got your market recap and the analysts are standing by. This segment of Taking Stock was brought to you by Bulwark Insurance Agency, Insurance Made Easy, and Massey United Insurance. How good is your insurance? Time now for your market recap, brought to you by Sagicor Investments. Think wealth, think Sagicor Investments. The Jamaica Stock Exchange advanced with the combined index gaining a whopping 5%. 109 stocks traded across both the main and the junior markets of the JC for the week ending Friday, May 7, 2021. 60 advanced, 40 declined, and 9 stayed the same. Nearly 157 million shares changed hands on the Jamaican dollar market, totaling nearly $1.3 billion. Derriman Trading Company traded the most, taking up nearly 16% of market volume. The stock lost one cent to open the week at $2.53. Sagicor Select Funds Financials traded the second highest, with people buying and selling nearly 20 million shares in the company. The stock gained three cents to open the week at 63 cents. And Fesco Ordinary Shares rounded out the most traded, taking up nearly 12% of market volume. The stock gained five cents to close last week at $1.07. Now let's see who had the biggest gains. Epley 7.5% preference shares due 2024 nearly rose 50% to close last week at $9.35. Following news of Main Event's partial acquisition by Supreme Ventures, Main Event Entertainment Group stock jumped 34%, giving it the second highest gains on the market last week. The stock opens this new week at $4.70. And rounding off the biggest gains, Salada Foods Jamaica stock advanced 26% to open this week at $9.40. On the losing side now, CAC 2009.5 Cumulative Redeemable Preference Shares stock fell 29% to close last week at 
Margarita Turks stock fell nearly 26% last week, down to $15.51. Rounding off the biggest losers, Portland JSX lost 25% to open this week at $7.11. Market Recap was brought to you by Sagicor Investments. Think wealth, think Sagicor Investments. This segment of Taking Stock, The Analysts, is brought to you by Ideal Portfolio Services. Welcome back to Taking Stock. I've got a team of analysts to examine the week in business. I'm joined by Auric Angus. He's Senior Wealth Advisor at Ideal Portfolio Services. And we also have with us this week Research and Strategy Analyst at Sagicor Investments, Jodianne Aris. Hi, Jodianne. How are you guys doing? Hi, Khalil. I'm good. Thanks for having me. Okay. So, uh, several things to look at on the market in the past week. Let's start with GHL. Guardian Holdings is now officially listed on the Jamaica Stock Exchange once again. It comes in as one of the most expensive stocks on the JSC, second only to Palace. Last week when we were talking about uh, GHL's upcoming listing at the time, uh, we weren't seeing, at least the analysts weren't seeing much interest in particular but that has changed now, hasn't it, Auric? Yeah, um, that has changed, and um, I am surprised by the by the the uptick in the queue based on what I saw yesterday. Um, on listing on Wednesday, there was not much happening. Like you said, um, it was it is the second highest, so it comes down to perception of it as well, based on how we know our local market operate. Um, but just by listing, the company listed 232 million ordinary shares. Um, that was a market cap of about $135 billion um, coming to the stock exchange, bringing it to a total of $1.9 trillion. Now, based on market cap, um, Guardian would have, is now the second largest listing on the stock exchange. Um, jumping Sajipur and Scotia, of course, so it's right behind NCB. In terms of the 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 reason why they were delisted before was as a result of them the stock not traded um, based on liquidity. But we have to to compare then versus no in the sense that um, the market wasn't really active during that time. Um, but for for them to to prevent that from happening again, I am not sure. I think it's likely that the, it, well, they don't seem like they plan to to consider any stock split. But I think a stock split in this um, environment would be better. But that's just my opinion. But um, aren't they, aren't they facing some of the same liquidity issues now? Meaning that we're not right. seeing, there's not people want to buy, but nobody's mm -hmm. selling. Right. right. So, so that's a, that's the challenge again there. So you don't want what what happened um, seven, eight years ago to have to to repeat itself. So I would I would, in my opinion, again, I would suggest that they carefully consider that. But at the end of the day, I mean, it it it, it comes down to value as well. If you want if you want value, then you have to pay for it. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, so I think it, it, again, it's perception. Um, I think, well, before we get to our stock splits, we'd have to consider, because how it is now is that there is strong on the buy, but I mean, in terms of selling, yeah. it's very weak. And I think part of that reason, or a potential reason, could be the fact that most of the shares were really in Trinidad and Tobago, were really on TTSE, and as such, in order for those to trade via their brokers, they would have to be registered here. So I think probably it's just a little yeah. bit of a time lag in terms of persons on that side of the market who probably are willing to sell in order to get their broker registered here so that they can execute that, that sort of trading. So I think probably it's just a little bit of a time lag and we should or hope to see a little bit more activity from that standpoint. Ah, interesting. So, all right. So there's a time lag issue, but still, do you think mm -hmm. they should do a stock split, Jody? Um, I, I think... Yes and no. I mean, yes, from the point that you normally have a stock to take it a little bit more liquidity, but as well as the fact that it's, we have to look at the counterparts, you know, when it is that if we were to do a split and how it would look in terms of on the other side, yeah. you know, in terms of any Definitely. chances back to CT dollars, um, it's still for on that side, not necessarily a disincentive at the price that it is at, but in addition, you have, you know, listed companies that are funds, such as select funds who should be seeking exposure and persons could also See that as an avenue to gain 
you know, exposure to a, a company like a Guardian. Mm. So, Auric, we've seen some mm -hmm. concerns in recent days about the fall in stock price of some big companies, or some big names, their prices have been falling. You see GK, Carib Cement, NCB, Sagicor Group being among those where uh, the prices have been falling. What's, what's going on? All right, yeah, so there were concerns surrounding that on, on Monday in particularly. Um, I think what happened, those were block trades. And by that, I mean traders from time to time when they have a large volume of, of, of um, shares to, to trade, they will match them on the market between other traders throughout the industry. So I think that's what happened. So for example, we saw where Carib Cement um, traded about $3.5 million worth of shares um, at $78. Um, that was a $10. $10.63 decline from the, the close price last week. So whenever we, like I said, whenever we do have large, large block trades, instead of fill them in, fill them in, fill it in smaller pieces, you'll find a buyer or a seller to match that and it, and it happens on the market. So you will see um, on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, when the market kind of went back to normal and by normal, I mean from where it was um, before those trades, trades were um, executed, um, things kind of get back to where they were. Um, again, I think around seven hundred and nine million dollars worth of stocks were traded on that day, and they were mainly among um, Carib Cement, Grace Kennedy, Sagicor, Scotia, and NCB, all of which fell off um, um, around average eight percent or so. So there is no reason to be concerned. No reasons to be concerned. As we, like I said, um, everything was back to normal um, the following day um, into towards the end of, end of the week. Mm. Jody, and I see some company results are out. It's, they seem to be coming out hand over fist now. With Sinker's net profit is up by sixteen percent. Uh, give me the rundown for Wisinko. All right. So we're seeing, I think one of those companies that has been impacted by, you know, school closure and entertainment lockdowns. Uh, what we're seeing for we is even though that they had a dip in revenue, we noticed that they still had a good bottom line and that's really based on cost reduction methods. So we'd have seen a dip in terms of admin expenses, selling and distribution, as well as the finance costs. One of the things that they pointed to, though, which is good news, is that their export what you know part of the exports arm actually increased by about 50 percent earning revenue from that segment and so they're looking at uk and the rebounding in international markets is actually providing some amount of boost for the company um i think as our overall outlook what we have to look to is you know is really the opening up or you know the vaccination programs going through and being successful and allowing for a little bit more opening up that would positively benefit companies like we're seeing but thus far, it's really reduction in cost measures as well as, you know, growth in the export era that has really been pushing for this quarter results. Now, Auric, Fast Rich's results are also out. What are the highlights there? All right. So the key highlights from this one was that the company reported a 22% increase in revenue. That was about $549 million. Um, this was as a result of increase in seven of, of their 11 product lines. And I think the reason for this level of increase in revenue is because of the construction activities that are surrounding us. Um, obviously, electrical supplies would have been in demand if, if construction is being um, taking place in the market. Now, um, the company expenses where they're, they're able to manage their costs, which, which, which is good. Um, the net profit was what grabbed me though. The company, um, three months net profit was, um, there was a 697% increase in, in their bottom line. Um, that's impressive. Obviously, that was as a result of um, um, other operating income, which include um, foreign exchange gains, and interest income in, um, in addition to the, the, the every revenue um, income that they have. The company's okay. stock price is up like around 107% year to date. Um, it traded as high as $9.50 um, based on when I last recall. 
Um, so you can look at the numbers there. Um, it has been really impressive. I think they're trying to also tighten up their supply chain, not to get um, get it out of control. So, so revenues, they don't have inventory waiting too long. And I think they're also looking to export. So I think all in all, good things happening overall. Those are the key highlights that I picked out from the report. And they, they're they also looking to go into um, water pipes and drain pipes. So they're looking to grab that section of the market and that part of their revenue is starting to bear fruit as, as the managing director had, had stated. So good stuff for Fast Rich. Um, yeah, you definitely want to look at pipes are moving away from the core they're not moving away they're adding it to their to their revenue stream well yeah yeah that's that's what i that's what i meant yeah. all yeah. right so one of my favorite companies to hold separat has actually seen yeah. a decline in net profits to jodian uh, down 14 percent why <laughs> uh, well one of the things for separate i think it moved you know it's converse to a single so separate reported higher revenue but lower profits and it's really linked to, for them, higher costs. So they would have faced a bit of a challenge for Q1. So they decided that, you know, heavy rains would have impacted the dairy plant um, and such. That was one of the factors that impacted as well as issues with logistics and shipping. So uh, there were higher shipping costs. I think part of what the reason is that you notice, particularly within a pandemic, you know, there are other areas that you may have to import goods from. And you may find that from time to time, you know, a supplier may, may not have a short supply and as such, you may have to see a different supplier, which could mean that you do so at a higher price or, you know, there's just reduced supply on the market and that could push prices up. So, so for separate, they're really, for the quarter, they're really hit by, you know, different, you know, really cost measures. And they saw that increase in terms of cost. So it was supply on one side, as well as logistics issues that would have hampered and led to delays and they may have had to implement measures so which should have caused costs to increase so you know revenue is good so that's still a good indication that you know there's still demand for the products for the company and there's still some positive that you can take away from it um separate is i think you know even though there may be a dip for this quarter it's still a sound company um the demand yeah. is they're still within a consumer food group so there's always going to be continued demand for products that are separate produces and as such it's just a dip for a quarter and not necessarily an indication that, you know, there is something fundamentally off with the company. So you can mm -hmm. continue to hold. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, All right, good. I think um, I think what we should move to as analysts, though, Kalila, is trying to set um, revenue and, and profit estimations for these company expectations before they report the results. And I, I think that's something that would be something new and refreshing to the market, just like on the US side. I know I don't want to compare them too much to us, but I think it's something that we could really look at. Um, when you when you when you set expectations and the company either top those expectations or fall short, then you can use it as a as a as a as a as a benchmark, you know, to kind of guide you um, where before these results are released. Right, because we do hear in the, the reporting on the U.S. markets, uh, profits were higher than expected, exactly. 10 lower exactly. than expected. So there, there are expectations that are set. So what would you yeah. use? You would look at um, some of the same well, conditions that they've reported. You'd have to go into yeah. various lot, markets, to look at conditions yeah. like weather and uh, mm. whatever might affect various companies. Mm -hmm. You prepared yeah, for lot. something like that, Jody Ann, your team? That's, that's well, something like more work and more resources. I, mean, I think it's part of what it is that we currently do. Um, because, yeah. I mean, as analysts, you know, to come up with a fair value for a company, you'd always have to be doing projections and having discussions with company to see what is expected, what's happening in the market. Um, I mean, for most parts, I and mean, institutional, institutional investors tend to price in for a particular stock prior to the results. So they would do their trades prior to the earning season. And so you'd have already counted in their price that they would have paid what it is that they think will happen based on projected earnings and not necessarily on earnings or performance as it happens. And so for each quarter, there's always that before. So you try to do your projections. So probably for a quarter one, when it is that you do a quarter one report, it's not necessarily linked to what it is that you're expecting for the next 
you know, what's happened on earnings season past is really looking at a 12 months forecast going ahead. So it is part of what it is done. I mean, it's just that we don't typically distribute. Yeah, so that's right. it's, it's not published. It's, 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 that's, that's for your yeah. internal team to make decisions, yeah. but us in the yeah. public, we're not privy to that information. Exactly. So you want to get all of those data, put them together, and get an average, you know? So right. Well, Auric, ideal can set the trend. Put it well, we, 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 we Just like Jody, we have it. <laughs> just like Jody, we have it internally. So, like I said, just to put it out there for everyone to see it so they can better make decisions. Mm hmm. Uh, so before we go, another one, I almost forgot this one. So SVL main event. Oh. SVL now has 10% equity stake in main event. Do you think this is a, a good fit for both companies? It seems so. They have some some synergies there. Auric, you first. Um, it, 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 it can play out well for them in the long term, seeing that entertainment is done now. SVL is a, is a very aggressive company, so looking into that space, is kind of an opportunity for them. Um, I can tell you though, it, it caught me off guard because I, I wasn't expecting a deal like that. But I mean, there, there's no problem in diversifying. Um, we always encourage companies and individuals to do that. So why not? Why they can't do the same? I mean, I have no objections to the deal. Um, yeah, that's that's my opinion in a nutshell. And I think too, because of the, the competition in the, the lottery space now to SVL, perhaps right. that's a so part of their motivation in looking to diversify because they've gone into now um, business process outsourcing, basically, mm -hmm. uh, logistics, uh, mm -hmm. back end services for businesses. They've gone into mm -hmm. different things. Um, Jody Ann, what's your take on the main event Supreme Ventures deal? Okay, so I mean, I'm, I'm not generally for companies diverse, you know, just stepping too much away from core. Um, but part of what we know is that with companies, as they reach a plateau probably in growth, that they have to, for to continue to get growth going forward, they have to look at different avenues, whether it be mergers or acquisitions to kind of spur that sort of growth. And as you mentioned, there is competition, particularly within the betting space. And, you know, it may have been a market that, you know, is really tapped out as a potential, as in, is there more that they could be getting from the betting segment that, you know, could be achieved? If not, then, then that would necessitate looking to other avenues. But I'm not really one big for companies venturing too much away from core. I prefer when a company is good at core and they continue to build on core. Yeah, somebody asked me if this is a conflict of interest for Solomon Sharp. What do you guys think? Um, um, it it is. Um, it, it it can be scrutinized. Um, but at the same time, I think they would have gone through the, the due diligence and and the legalities behind it. So um, I don't know. I don't know. I, I saw it though, and I was thinking about that. Um, but I think all in all, it, it is it is fairly okay for them to do that. Yeah. So Solomon is chairman of SVRL Supreme Ventures Racing and Entertainment, and, came and, us, yeah. and then main event is also his company. And right. then Gary Beard, who um, is also a good friend of his on the board of Neighbor and SVR and came on as well. <laughs> So, I mean, I think part of it is really when you look at markets that are not generally part of the thing, our market is not necessarily as big as, you know, we sometimes imagine. Um, It's really how it is that a company is going to, within their corporate governance policy control related party interaction. So that it's really the framework that they would design to control it. Um, So how it is on the appearance, you know, it factors into, you know, how you think about ethics. However, there has to be some guiding principles or guidelines that you know would factor into how it is that you control related party transactions and related party relations. That would be probably one of the four things that as analysts we'd want to assess. Um, mm -hmm. But within a market space that's not very very big, you know, you it is likely that you could have these sort of relationships that on the surface, you know, there are quite a bit of linkages with other related parties. Mm. Well, thank you guys for your analysis this week. Always appreciated. Thank you, Kalila. No problem. No problem. All right. Cheers, right. guys. This segment of Taking Stock with the Analysts was brought to you by Ideal Portfolio Services. 
That's our show for this week. Thanks for watching. Make sure you like this video, subscribe to this channel and share with a friend. Also subscribe to our newsletter at kalilareynolds.com and turn on those post notifications so that you can be the first to see all my other features. We want to help people learn more about money so we can all get this money together. Now this week on Money Mondays JA, I'm walking you through how to use JTrader Pro to trade stocks online like a pro. On Money Moves JA, last week I told you about Honeybun Foundation's new Gap app. This week I'll show you exactly how to use it. Follow me on Instagram and Twitter at Kalila Ray and follow at Taking Stock JA on Instagram. If you want to connect with the analysts this week, check the description box below for their contact information. Also visit our website, kalilarunnels.com for financial information you can use however you like it. Watch, listen, or read. Now tell a friend about taking stock. Investing is the new sexy. So let's make it cool to talk about money. I'm Kalila Runnels. Stay safe out there, guys. Let's get this money. <laughs> <laughs>